All right, here we are back at the bench on a lovely November Sunday. And what do we have? Along with a couple of penguins. I'm going to put over here on the side, keep them safe. A little cleaner. And I got a couple of things. This is going to be like a vlog and a little bit of instructional and going to go over some boring technical things and just show off a couple of stones. That's for later. I got this great blade last year. Never honed it. It's been on my bench. I went at it um, this week, honed it on tape, and then reversed that without tape because I prefer without tape. I just wanted to see whatever. This is a Revizier. Highly recommended. Great blade. 8.8, eight, full hollow, plain edge. They also come with like a glitzy edge. Horn scales, very well done. Recommended blade, I think. Uh, the grind isn't perfect, but it worked for me. And I ran into some difficulty honing it because I tried to do something that I shouldn't have done, but I wanted to see if I could get away with it because basically I'm testing out a new stone. Well, not new, but new to me. And I'll get to that in a minute. So anyway, so this is out. This is new. It's new in the world retail. It's new to me. I just got it a couple of weeks ago. This is a uh, Washita from Norton. It's an eight by two half inch thick. Now, I, I have reference stones, right? I have pieces of uh, vintage Washita soft arcs. I got others over there. And I use these for comparison to check stones. I either scope them or use magnifying glass and compare the structure of the stone and the porosity and all this stuff. And so on and so forth. A little bit of overkill, but for me, this set is, uh, it's enlightening. You know, do I need it? No, it's just one of those things I have in my house. So I got this and I compared and my take is this is more like a soft arc than it is like a washita. At first I didn't see any washita structure and I can't really show it to you here, but there's a patterning in washita, the old school stuff that was not visible to me until I lapped it. And then a little tiny bit of it showed up. The reverse side, both sides had this finish. It just awful. You know, just th this side, I, I can't use. There's like divots. There's like, I don't know, the ink mark. The X means to me, don't use it. In the heat of a honing marathon, I can like start honing on the wrong side quite easily. So I give myself a visual to stop me from making a bad mistake. So the other side was a little better. Lapped it down. Painfully slow. Not even close to the speed of a washita. More like a soft arc, but not a great one. Is it a decent stone for $29? Yeah. But to be honest, I got to tell you, it's not really a washita to me. Good experimental stone. Uh, buying a full size number one can run a few bucks easily, three times the cost of this, depending on what you find. So there's that. I think this will make a nice axe stone or a good general purpose stone, good for a toolbox, good for a quick cleanup of a chisel, good for a heavy duty knife blade. Maybe not for a super fine refined edge type of knife, but for a general purpose, you know, kick around blade, yeah, sure. Stuff like that, it'll work. Thirsty as hell, whatever you put on it soaks right through. It's the porosity is like incredibly open. So there's that. But I thought it was kind of cool, and I think it's neat that Norton's offering this type of thing. It's a little different than the regular offering. So anything to do with new stuff is groovy, right? Well, it can be. So there's that. So had that, and uh, oh, yeah, what else? This thing. Oh, man, what, what that looks like a shaft thing, Keith. No, it's not a shaft thing. It's a shaft thing box. In it, that's what I keep my uh, naughty 12K. Superstone. This is one of the new ones. What a pain in the ass this stone has been. Literally, for a synth, I, I, I just, I literally almost threw it out. So when I got it, let me show you what I'm talking about. I'll give you a little visual. If I was looking at it from the edge, right? Okay. I was looking at it edge on. So in other words, yeah, that's not good perspective, Keith. But anyway, so if that was my view, what I actually saw was going to do the top of the stone. 
was like this. Now, you're like probably saying to yourself, well, no big deal. You just have to, you know, lap it. So I kept lapping it and it kept, it stayed like this. <laughs> and you say that's impossible and so did I. And I just kept like banging my head against a brick wall until I was like, enough. Okay, I had lapped and lapped and lapped and it would not get flat. Then it got a little flatter and then I put it on the side. And it, two days later, I had this like humpback thing. And you're saying it can't be. It's impossible. Nani was a good company. They would never do anything like that. Yeah, my ass. Okay. So you would think that you could just flatten like, you know, and then eventually the points would meet and that that wasn't happening. And like logic and reason was not applying. So I realized that there was another force at play here with this lovely 12K super stone. Now, mind you, I'm not big on synthetic stones and the finishing range, but I will say this. 12K super stone, as a rule of thumb, not with this one, as a rule of thumb. They're like brain dead easy. You make the investment, you flatten it, you don't have to ever do more than 15 passes, really, maybe 20, 22, maybe 25, but no more than that because if you dig your groundwork, you don't need more polishing than that, and then you're golden. You don't have to lap it all the time because you're putting no wear on it because your, your touch is light, so your investment is like rocking. I mean, it's just like it's a go-to. It's reliable, and it puts on a pretty decent finish. It's shavable, you know? To me, this is where synthetics really start to like, you know, break away from those old synthetic edges. This, this is a, a solid stone, usually, not this one. So what was the problem? I'm going to drop a photo in here. Okay, so now you've seen what I was looking at. That was the center of the stone. It had that lunar landscape. And I start, what happened was I, I scoped it and I, I used a magnifying glass and a loop. And I kept, I went literally centimeter by centimeter. There was a patterning on the edges, which unfortunately I lapped out. But it was like a grid. You could barely see it, but it was there. When you hit the light right and you moved it around and you got it a little wet... So it looked like it was like on a rack to cool or something. And it looks like, I don't know, something was too hot, something was too cold, that type of thing. And it left a mark. And it was on both sides. And it was more prominent here than it was at the extremes. In the very center, you saw that lunar landscape shit. I had that literally like right here, which is ironically where that hump was. So what I did was, and I don't recommend this because it, it's problematic to do what I'm about to talk about. But I used uh, silicon carbide powder. I used 80 grit on a stainless plate that I know to be true, and I beat the crap out of this stone. I just stripped off so much stuff. Now, I don't recommend that because those particles can break down and embed into the stone, and the only reason I was okay with it was I had written the stone off and didn't really care. This was an experiment, and it was either going to fly or die. And I figured that if I did manage to get it flat, I would be doing so much lapping to resurface after any embedded stuff was going to come up for sure. So I was going to be safe if I made it. So you can see it's still here, so it made it. Because <laughs> trust me, I got no problems throwing shit in the garbage. I actually like to throw stuff out. It feels good. It's cathartic. It's cleansing. <laughs> okay, so um, after I did the 80 grit... The whole surface of this stone was wrecked, okay? You would not hone on it. Under a loop, and I should have, I really should have uh, photographed that, but I, I don't have time to photograph everything and scope pictures and all that bullshit that I, I, don't, I don't have that fucking level of ego. Anyway, the stone was trashed. So I went at it with a 140 Atoma for a really long time, and then a 140 that was worn. I have several stages of plates to work with then i went to a um 400 okay that was rather new and then a 400 that was worn you know and then 600 um wet dry so now i have again a working 12k now i say again because i've had like six of them 
And funnily enough, my first one was a thin one on the base, and I hated the base, and I hated the stone, so I got rid of it. Then I got a thin one. I hated that stone because it was like weird. There was something up with it, and it, it was too thin for me. I just thought it was crap. This is way back when. So I got rid of that. And then I bought a thick one, and I think they used to be an inch. I wound up buying two of them because I got the second one on a deal. One of the two, I think it was the second one, had basically the same problem this one did. The center was like crust and had to be seriously decked, and it took forever to lap it. Then I finally got it where I wanted it, but that one never felt right. And the other one was okay, and I used that for a while. And then I got out of finishing on synths. And I got away from them. And now I have a couple of synth finishes hanging around. It's more of a comparative thing to me. I, I don't need this stone. Um, but I like to talk coherently, and I want to talk logically, and I want to talk in a relevant way. In other words, I don't want to be the guy that says, well, I used to, because who gives a shit what you used to do, right? I can say, oh, yeah, I pulled it out and compared it to my whatever, and this is what I see. And then, like, it becomes a lot more real. So there's that. So anyway, uh, you know, the thing with Nani Superstones, now they warp, okay? The, the thin ones especially. I had a, that's right, I had a modern, a new 12K Superstone also. I bought that and that thing was like a banana, okay? I would lap it and I would wake up the next day and it was like literally bananaed off the, off the counter. It was point, you could rock it. Then it would flatten it and then it would do it again. And I know somebody uh, in the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I think it's in uh, one of the forums. He's like epoxied his to like some sort of like tile surface to keep it flat. And like to me, if you have a stone that's putting that much upward force, it's that force is going to happen one way or another. Gluing it down is going to r- remove the resulting banana shape, but that force isn't leaving. So there's always, you know, tension in the rock. That one way or another is going to come out. <laughs> I mean, I suppose maybe you could train it to not do that eventually or something. I don't know. But who the hell wants to deal with that crap? So I have a hard time with these stones now. It's like the Chosera line started cracking. I got rid of them. The Super Stones, for the most part, they're too soft and too slow for me. The 12K is solid. The 10K was always solid. The 1K, pointless. 3K, eh. 5K, eh. 8K, yeah, pretty good, but not the best, but workable. Um... The lower grit stuff, I think there's a 400 or something. It's like, yeah, whatever. But the 12K was always like, people would ask me, what's a good finisher? You know what? Buy this. Go out, use that, and let that be your benchmark. It's only like, I don't know, 100 bucks, which seems like a lot in the <laughs> when you're buying stones. 100 bucks is like, oh, my God, it's $100. And then in three years, you're like, gee, you know, I don't know if I want that because it's $1,000. <laughs> so things change. Anyway, so I wanted to just share, like, you know, if you run into that kind of a problem with a nani, chances are you got to beat up on it really bad, and then good luck. You know, I, I can't really recommend these stones anymore, though. Um, just too many problems. Naniwa, got to get their shit together. They're so capable. They're so capable of, like, really rocking it, but they keep shooting themselves in the foot with these, I don't know what it is, quality control shit, something, I don't freaking know. Anyway, so there's that. And... Uh, yeah, this is pretty neat that you can put it into a, fits perfectly in a Shapton Pro Box. Have a couple of these laying around so it keeps it clean. You know what I do with this? I use this for doing the Oroshi work on uh, Hocho, you know, Oroshi. Um, you know, when you have uh, Kata, you have, uh, what do you call it? Single bevels. Anyway, so you saw this guy and you saw them and then you saw the other thing. I showed you the razor, right? Really nice blade. Shaves really well. So what happened to me with this was... Um, do I have it handy? Yeah, okay. So I have these two Shaptons, right? This is the uh, 4K and 6K. These are the glass stones, but these are the um, the gray stone. I, I think they're high carbon HC or something like that. I, I can't remember. One, one series is HR, one size is HC. Anyway, so you can tell uh, they're a little different than the regulars because how white the regular one is. That's a 1K. So my goal was to test jumping 1K to 6K. Because typically what I would do is go 1K, 4K. These are on the windowsill dry. Let's put that over here for a minute. So... 
It was a pretty decent 1K. I prefer the Shafton Pro 1.5, but this is doable. Totally doable still. Um, so what happened? All right, well, uh, let me see if I can. What happens is, okay, you know manufacturers, they have all these like different grits and people in the uh, forums are always willing. They're the poobas, you know, the guys that know everything. They, you know, they post 40 times a day. Um, they always tell you what you need. They, they want, you don't need that, okay? Someone wants to do 1K, 3K, 5K. You're going to get like 10 guys saying, ah, you don't need the 3K. What are they basing that opinion on? Their long-term history. How many, how many blades have they honed? How many different types of steel? How many different rocks? How long have they been doing this? What's their background? What's their testing procedure? Have they actually done a scientific method on anything? Or are they just honing and talking out their ass? You can probably guess what I think. So anyway, so here's a list of grits. 1K, 2K, 3K, 5K, 10K. These are um, roughly for the 90 watt Chaucera stones. You know, now the professional. So i show you this. You start out at 11.5. That's microns. You know, 2K is 6.7. 3K is 4. 2.8 for the 5K. Um, there is no 8K, but if there was, it would probably be around um, 2 microns. And then the 10K, that big, fat, really expensive thing, 1.47. Okay, so you have that. So here's what happens. Let me just talk about the, the bevel for a second. Let's just say you have a bevel. Right? Edge. So you're honing and you're creating striations. Because polishing, honing, sharpening, it's all about scratching steel. That's all you're doing. You're taking like a pointy hard thing that's an abrasive particle and digging into the steel. And you do you use particles of decreasing size to polish, polish, polish. And when you get to the real fine stuff, you start to see a mirror come up because the striations are so close together and they're so shallow that you have ach you're achieving some sort of a highly reflective surface like a mirror. All right, so you got that. Now, what happens in the real world is not so perfect as that ideological situation like this because you're honing like this... Let me get over here. You're honing like this. You're honing like that. You're doing this like that. Some people doing circles. The blades going like this. A little pressure here, a little pressure there. Okay, so you don't have a, a laboratory environment. So what you wind up with, okay, here's your striations, right? Invariably, you wind up with some that overlap. You wind up sometimes with striations going the other way. You wind up with like a hodgepodge of lines. The majority of them are kind of basically kind of be going the same way. So you look at it with like 4X, 8X, whatever loop, and it's going to look dandy, you know, and you got these guys with uh, high powered magnification. They light it a certain way and everything looks fantastic. Did you see my last video where I did the bevel on the um, barber hone? Look at that bevel in the photos that I, I posted. And when you look at it, the, they look good, right? So I polished it. Trust me, that, that's not that polished, okay? That's how I shot it. And I didn't shoot it to make it look polished. I shot it so I didn't get a reflection back in my face. A lot of photography and lighting I do is based on angles so I don't get glare and flare. I do a lot of on-camera lighting. People say you can't do it. I do it. Been doing this long enough to figure it out. So what happens is, is the metal looks a lot cleaner than it really is. So I got people emailing me, "Wow, that bevel looks so polished. I can't believe it from a you know crappy stone like that." And it's like, ah, dude, stop looking at photos on the internet and deriving conclusions from what you think you're looking at because photos lie. People lie first, and then photos lie second. Now you got a compound lie, right? So anyway, stick to the real deal. And I'm going to share some right now. People are going to get pissed off. I don't really care. So you have this problem. Well, not problem, but you have this condition where you have intersecting lines. So what happens is, here's your edge, right? Edge. So you have a line, a striation coming this way. And you have another striation going this way. And then you have another striation coming this way. And then you have like some circular bullshit. 
like this. So in a magnified, if you magnify this area, what you wind up with, let me just draw two. One going this way and one going that way. Right here. Okay. This is almost like a perforation. At a microscopic level, at units of measure in the micron, submicron, and angstrom range, you are actually perforating it. That's why your line is never, your edge is never really a perfect line. It, it's always kind of a little bit of a saw. It depends on how much magnification you're using, but you're always going to have that. By using finer and finer grits, you're healing. So you start off with wah, 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 big giant shark teeth bullshit, right? And your goal is to minimize that to something not quite like this, because you wouldn't shave with that. This is an illustration, okay? And I'm a lousy artist, but you're getting the idea. So finer and finer grits take the edge from this to this, and you keep going, whatever. But at that sub-micron level, you have this perforation. This is key. Now, I'm blowing through my pad of post-its over here. So anyway, so now you have these grits. So you got... 1K is 11.5, 2K 6.7, 3K 4.0, 5K 2.8. Some poobah is going to say you don't need the 3.K, uh, the, excuse me, you don't need the 4.03K. So he's going to say, take this out, it costs too much money, you don't need it. He's going to say, you don't need this 2K either, you don't need it. You can go straight from the 1K to 5K because, and he, here's, the, here's the phrase, one of the phrases I hate the most. I do it all the time and it's fine. Please qualify that. How do you know I would like shaving with your edge? You don't. You just don't. So what happens is, right, when you jump over these grits, 6, 7, you know, and then 2.8, you're asking the preceding grit to do a lot. You're expecting a lot. Can it work? Sure. How well does it work? It depends. So let's just say, you know, what, you know, grits, grits go, grit, you have particles, you have a nominal, let's say we're talking about uh, one K, all right, so according here, it's 11.5, so that's almost 12, but the whole stone isn't made out of that, you have larger, which are, can be quite significant, and this is by GIST standards, and then you have a bunch that are smaller. There are going to be more smaller than there are larger, and there's an allowable percentage of both. However, these large bastards are there, and they can wreck your day. So, let's just say this was 12 micron. Okay? Nominal, large, babies. And now, you want to jump to the 5K at 2.8, which is 3. So if this was 12, and you're going right to 3, which is about 25%. So what is that, like about that big? And then this big one is like that, and then the little one is like that, or whatever. This is artist rendering, folks. But I think you can see now what I'm talking about. You're asking this particle, this is the majority of your 5K, to attack and eliminate all of the striations made by these big fat boulders that were in the 1K. Can it work? Maybe. You have to work it a lot. The more you work it, the more prone to other distractions like uh, burrs and foils and stuff like that. All right? Can it work? Yes, it can work. Let's talk about science, though. Let's talk about logic and reason. Let's just say you went with... The 2K first, or even the 3K, all right? They're in the middle of these two. So this particle has a better shot at dealing with this than that one does. And this is why I am a fan of incremental progression, not big jumps based on pocketbook. Yes, it costs less to buy fewer stones, but... Happiness is what this is all about, okay? For me, if you look at my toolkit over here, 122, 23, 21.5, 2K, 5K, 8K, 12K. Those are my pros. 
Those are the stones that I rely on all the time. And if they had a 3K, I'd get it. <laughs> but they don't have one. All right? So that's what happens there. So by not having that, what do you want to call it, efficiency due to uh, an incremental progression, this little sector, this perforation, this stands a greater chance of being your, your worst enemy. Because what happens is, if you look at the striation at the edge, that is going to be hard for me to show because I'm not a good artist. But as, say that's the edge, well, whatever. Let's say that's the striation. This is actually the edge. So the striation comes down to here where it terminates right at the edge. And this is just like the rest of the blade. And then this takes off in that direction. And then there's a whole bunch of these in succession. They all butt into each other, hopefully. When you're polishing, I'm really sorry, I'm not a good artist. But when you're polishing, right? If I draw this, this is another. So this is a surface and this is a surface. This is a surface, this is a surface. When you're polishing, you're working on all of these surfaces. This line at the bottom is technically a surface also. And when you're polishing this, you're breaking through. And then when you have the crossover striation that we saw in here, which I am unable to draw that and have it not look like a log jam that threw up, I think you can kind of get in your mind's eye the picture I'm trying to draw. You create mayhem. You wind up with problems here. So a lot of people who talk about chipping, you know, that's where this comes from, okay? When I say, you know, people tell me, oh, can I, uh, can I overhone? Yeah, you can. But what happens is most people underhone. That's what happens. All right, so let me clean up some of this autistic nonsense here. Did you get that? Take another look. Anyway, it's in the, national, the unified grid chart. That's where I got the numbers from. So it's helpful, but it's online. You don't need to copy it from here. So anyway, that subject brings me, that's what happened here. So I went from 1K to 6K and I wound up with like um, some teeth like down at the edge. So I wound up with some sort of a toothiness down here that I was watching develop and I was going to see how far I could go with it and what the actual result was. So I ran with it and then polished it down and then shaved with the teeth and watched the edge sort of decline in efficiency and so on and so forth. And this is how I test stuff. I actually put it to a physical test and then I test down and I test up. And what I mean by that is, you know, I will um, try the same thing with a slightly different progression and sort of increase and decrease, sort of vacillate back and forth between like data points to come to a clear understanding on exactly how the steel is responding to my honing work. I can look at it and, and know, but I really want to feel it so I know exactly what the end result is on my skin, which is all that really matters. So there's that, which is why one of the reasons why I never show like edge photos, because it's kind of like, yeah, okay, fine, but what does it feel like on my face? Because that's all that really matters. And um, the other thing is, is I can show you anything. If, if And I know that I wouldn't do that but I know that it's done and it can be done. So I want to be removed from that arena. Okay. I want to talk about logic, reason, and science, not like some bullshit photography session that I set up to, you know, formulate confirmation bias. So anyway, I've rehoned this today and I went a little more incrementally and uh, the polish is really good. And I think I'm going to have a much better shave. That's what I think, and I'm going to finish this on my JNAT over there. And, all right, so where was I going with all of that? Well, what happened was also in the course of the last short term, I, I, you also me, I did a video on this thing. This is the Shapton 7. Um, this is the equivalent of the 30K Shapton glass stone. Uh, it's the same stone. I, I had them side by side. Um it's a few points off numbers wise for microns, but remember, this is the same company that had the 12K shaft in, um, in Japan and they sell it here as 15K. It's the same stone, folks. Don't be fooled. Um, I don't know how they calculate stuff. I don't know what the story is, but there's that. So I have this and I've been using it sort of intermittently as a little baby finishing stone, but I had also picked up this, which is the equivalent of the 16K 
16K is like 0.92. This is 0.85. Side by side, same stone, same polish, same striation pattern. Absolutely no difference in feel, feedback, nothing at all. Okay. I, I got these because the 30K and the 16K represent like, I don't know, almost $500 in stone. And I hardly ever use them. And honestly, these little stones um, suffice here. And I'm good. I'm absolutely good with this for what I need it for. Um, I do like five to 10 passes on these stones because that's what works best, so on and so forth. And that's all I need. So I traded the other two out for some Nagura and I picked this up for myself. I can throw these in a travel kit or use them as a comparison stone or once in a while I'll do a full synth edge and, and hone on these and get a great edge. Now I know what you're saying. Keith, if that's equivalent to the 16K, aren't you worried it's going to chip your edge? No. <laughs> and like when people say to me, the 16K chips edges, I'm like, oh, you know, do you also think that other people's cars dent your fenders? No, your car's dented because you can't drive, not because other people's cars dent fenders. And the same thing with these things. They have to be used right. And these are kind of like tedious stones, no joke. They're very, very fine. They're also very, very active. And, all right, if you're going to use these stones and you don't have impeccable groundwork and you haven't cleaned this up, like I showed you in the other, you know, what I'm talking about here is all of this intersecting stuff and forming a very fry, not friable, but a fragile thing in here. It becomes like a perforation. It just like snaps off and it leaves this giant fucking tooth. Okay. Here is the, the blown up version of that, where you have this valley where you're polishing in these directions and then straight down also, and you're creating a distraction. If you bring that type of edge to these stones, you're done. And then on top of that, you get these guys who are like, do a hundred laps on a 12K. I, I, I almost want to choke those people. You should never have to do that much work on a 12K. You should never do. It's not a great edge. Do your groundwork. You know, 20 laps on a 12K and you're good. The 16K shaft and the 30K, they've sold like millions of them. Okay. The people complaining, very narrow window of opportunity. Whenever you see that, you know that it's user-centric, user error. Now, are there some bad stones out there? just like my Naniwa 12K, very possible. So that could feed into it too. But the 12K, excuse me, the 16K and the 30K shafting, great stones, but I don't like the feel. And to be honest, I have a 10K, it's over there. I'm not going to pull it out. So this can sit out, okay? This is like super superfluous to me. The 16K saw like no action. The 10K to this is fine. So why isn't that a problem with that big a jump? Well, it's not that big a jump comparatively. And the other thing is it's very minor work here. And we're already at that super, super end stage where you're in the final stages of healing. You're not talking about trying to heal gouges made from, you know, 12 micron stones. So the process changes as you go along. Okay. That's why I say, get your groundwork nailed and then the world's your oyster. If you're going to sit there and try and make up Add 1K work on a 5K, you're going to be miserable. You're going to have a shitty edge. So anyway, that's the thing. I don't want to go on and on and on. I think I got my point across. Um, you know, people have been asking me for weeks, you know, chipped edges and chapped edges. Like, stop. <laughs> Just stop. Okay. Um, the so-called proof and evidence showing that 16K chapped in glass stones, chip edges, is literally fucking laughable, okay? Um, I had a Ilya La Rot Sia, is that how you pronounce it? That that doormat stone. And I, I tried so hard to get that to not chip my edges. C totally different scenario, okay? That stone has hard shit in it that just destroys very fine edges. You probably won't notice. If you don't know how to hone past what I call an AK edge, you'll probably never notice that stone doing stuff that's bad. But if you bring one of my polished edges to it, yeah, it's going to chip every single time. Do they all do that? I have no idea. But that one did. But I did my best to prove how it couldn't, and I just could not come up with a way to make it stop chipping. 
uh, outside of shortchanging my edge and coming to it with a five or AK um, level edge. And even then it was kind of sketchy. So my point here is that people saying the 16 K completely different story with the 16 K chipping. Uh, I don't buy into it. I don't think you should buy into it either. I will say you don't need it. Go with the 10K. If you need something after that, get a natural. Try the 30K for a couple of passes. You'll be golden. I mean, if you have to do that. Um, I would not recommend going AK 16K. No, not good. Um, the AK, you have to do still a little bit more work. So work from 4 or 6K. Go to 10K, then jump to the 30K for a few passes. I think you'll be okay. So there's that. Anyway, so penguins are saying it's time to go. So listen, all of this, it's all about having fun. So get uh, your stones on the bench, get your blades out, hone up some good edges, and have some fun. Till next time, take care. Talk to you soon.